I want to talk to you about this because I talked to a lot of transport executives and they talked to me about what their customers are saying about nearshoring and reshoring. You have a prediction for us. You say about 80 percent of U.S. companies are going to bring their manufacturing back to the U.S. Are you saying all their manufacturing, some? Give us a sense of the kind of nuance in that prediction. Sure, sure. So we got two predictions for 2026, and one of them is made in America, made to win. Uh, so reshoring is today's competitive baseline. Made in America is quickly becoming made to win. And if you're not rebuilding capacity here at home, you're ceding market share to those who are. So as you talked about uh, in our manufacturing outlook, 29 percent of CEOs said they've already brought back work, but a bigger percentage are now saying they're planning to do that. And you're going to see that. Is it going to be everything? Probably not. But you're going to see that being a competitive advantage. And if you're not got manufacturing back here, you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. All right. How important are the idea of Federal Reserve rate cuts to this idea of bringing uh, manufacturing here to the U.S.? Is it dependent on that? Right now, it's kind of priced in two cuts next year. Do we need those two cuts to really boost that manufacturing? Or does the Trump tax and spending bill, does that give enough incentive for companies to do it? I, I think the reasons why manufacturing coming back to America extend beyond rate cuts or even tariffs. And, and there's sort of two things I talk about. And one is another one of the... Uh, predictions we've got uh, for 2026, and that's that AI is going to reshape the manufacturing workforce. So AI now is no longer a pilot project. In 2026, it becomes how manufacturers operate. And because of that AI, that's going to be bringing work back to America. That's going to create more automation. It's going to turn AI into productivity, not cost-cutting. And that's going to favor localized manufacturing. Whether it's in the United States or another country, it's going to favor being localized. And then the second reason is, and you saw this, and this is a bipartisan issue, people are viewing manufacturing increasingly as a national security issue. Can we take care of our own needs, particularly in critical industries that started in the Biden administration, it's carrying through the Trump administration, again, irrespective of rate cuts, irrespective of who's sitting in the White House, that's a trend that's here to stay, and it goes back to our first, first prediction, we made in America made to win. All right. So you're mentioning the White House. So, Rania, I want to talk to you. And whether companies are doing this at their board of directors meetings or in the C-suite or using AI even, I would assume that some companies are trying to game out the cost of bringing manufacturing back here to the U.S. versus keeping it where it is, not knowing who the next president's going to be. So for some companies and maybe some of your, your, your customers, are they telling you, we're going to set up some operations here but keep the other operations going overseas and try to kind of basically wait and see who wins the White House coming up in a few years? Uh, I don't think so. But you definitely, again, going back to you got your people, it's a competitive advantage. You got to bring manufacturing back here. In terms of your global supply chains, I think people are looking for diversification. I don't see a lot of customers trying to game 2%, 3%, 5%, but they are thinking about their strategy beyond just one particular country and thinking about multi sourcing it. And again, that's a, for us a competitive advantage. One of the reasons we've been growing so nicely this year, our marketplace is really well set to allow that diversification to happen. And that's what customers are looking for. They're not looking at 1% or 2%. They're saying, hey, how do I be in multiple locations and ensure that irrespective of what the regime is or whatever you know, black swan events happen, my supply chain is resilient and I can deliver it to my end customers. All right. So we're talking about the administration right now. Uh, comments from the administration in recent weeks were that a lot more Americans need to consider blue collar jobs. At the same time, you're saying manufacturing companies are having a hard time attracting Gen Z talent. How do you bridge that gap? Well, I mean, there's the thing. The blue-collar jobs we're talking about now are high-tech jobs. And we talk about how manufacturing is becoming the new Silicon Valley. So if you're going to learn about AI and you have to be in manufacturing, you're fusing these things, things, those two things together. So now you're talking about blue-collar jobs that are high-tech and that are high-paying and in high demand and are critical for national security. That's going to be very attractive to the young people in our workforce today.